see the screen. If you cannot, please go ahead and leave a little message in the chat window, and uh, I'll see if I can tweak some of these options for everything to pop up. In the meantime, we are going to jump right into it. Um, thank you very much for coming, and uh, I just want to reiterate that uh, this is to learn about the fundamentals of some marketing practices. You're not going to be learning any crazy tricks. You're going to be learning tried and true things. So have some notes ready, and uh, I will be answering questions on the IGDA Facebook page, and also my email address is all throughout this presentation. Feel free to email me. I want to answer your questions. I want to help. So let's pop right in. Here's me. I've uh, been in marketing for about 10 years. I started off as a journalist game reviewer. I have a strong background in PR and social media. Uh, most recently I worked with Intel promoting their app store and I helped Tiger Cell launch Waking Mars. Now onto the fun stuff, or rather what this session isn't about. This is not an exhaustive session. You will not be learning all the details about PR. You will not be learning everything about event marketing. You're going to be learning basic simple things that, will, that anyone can do that will help you be more effective in marketing your game. This is also not for someone with big budgets. If you have big budgets, go and hire someone to help you. <laughs> this is something, this presentation is for people who have almost no money or no money at all. These are going to be things that you can do. All you have to do is spend time. So what will we cover? Low or no budget marketing. Stuff that's good for launches. If you have already launched, you will be able to do some of these things, but all of these tactics are always best before launch. Ideally, you're going to want to get started thinking about your marketing at least six months before you launch. Ideally, you'll want to start thinking about it as soon as you've started coming up with your idea for whatever your game is. So, quick agenda. We're going to cover four big topic areas. Marketing strategy, social media, PR, and events. So we're going to kick right into the marketing strategy. And I'm just going to double check to make sure no one has any comments. Everything looks good. OK. Off we go. Your best marketing strategy will be completely foiled if you choose the wrong platform. This is something I'm sure all of you think about and talk about a lot. But please be careful when you choose what platform your game is going to launch on. If you don't have any customers there, then the best game in the world, the best development team in the world, will just flounder. So when you think about marketing, think about where you're going to be selling. Think about where your game is going to be. And think about, more importantly, where your audience is going to be. So with that thought, let's finally jump into all the marketing stuff. When you think about your marketing plan, I want you to think about the four P's. The four P's of product. What is your game? Who is it for? What's it like? Is it, is it similar to any other types of games? Do you have an RPG? Do you have a Metroidvania? This will help you. Under, you'll, be, you'll be able to look at your competitors, people who have come before. It will help you understand what worked for them and what didn't. Price. There's a lot of craziness around price right now. There's the race to 99 cents or free on mobile platforms. There's the crazy sales on Steam. You need to think about your price because that's going to wildly affect how well your, your game is going to sell. Promotion. You need to think about your promotion. Um, when, you're, when you're just getting started with uh, developing your game, when you're thinking about your product, you're thinking about the price point you want to hit. You want to think early on what you can do, what is within your capabilities, what have people done before you, what can you do to promote this realistically. And then place, what, what's your platform going to be? What country or countries, or is this going to be a global launch? You need to have all of these things in place when you start your marketing plan. It seems remarkably simple, it seems blazingly obvious, but Take the time early on to write all this stuff down, and it'll help guide you as you progress. By the way, there will be a Q&A session at the end of this. 
So determining your target market, this is pretty important. Um, who's going to be playing your game? What do they play now? Are they playing anything similar? What platforms do they buy? If you're making a solitaire, a card game, um, developing for Vita, PlayStation Vita might not be the best choice. It might be. Um, developing for a mobile platform like Android or iOS might be a better bet. Something like Xbox Live Arcade, probably not. Probably not a good idea. But what you want to do is find your target market. And this is actually going to be relatively simple. Look at similar games to what you've created. Find out where people are talking about it. Just do a Google search. Look for forums. Look for places where the game has been reviewed. Take a look at the comments. Look, look to try and get a sense. It can, it's okay to generalize, but try and get a sense. Are these people older? Are they younger? Are they male or female? Are they professionals or not? All of these things, all of these factors, are going to affect how you're going to market to them. They'll also help you get a sense of how to get them excited. Did a similar game just not get them excited? Take a look at that game and think about what you can do differently. Did that game excite them? What can you do similarly? Again, these sound blazingly obvious, but the best marketing is. <laughs> and of course, how will you sell to them? If you are targeting uh, tweens, uh, ch children aged 12 to 15 or 16, I, I don't remember the range exactly, they probably don't have their own credit cards, so they may not be able to use Steam or PayPal. So is there some alternate means of reaching them? If you're reaching professionals aged 35 to 45, you know you can set a pretty good price, a pretty high price point, depending, of course, on your, on your um, gameplay experience. So these are all the things you want to think about at the start of your marketing plan, and they will help shape the PR, the social media, and so on that you will do. So this is an outline of a marketing plan. It doesn't have to be a 30 or 40 or 50 page document. It can just be one piece of paper as long as you follow these four main things. What is your objective? Do you want to sell 10,000 copies of your game? Do you just want to give it away for free in order to have something to put on your resume? Write that down. Figure out what you want to do. And again, that's going to help shape everything that you do after. So what's your strategy? Do you want to create some buzz? Do you just want to make sure that all the professors in the world try your game? Or only Will Wheaton tries your game? How are you going to do it? Tactics. The difference between strategy and tactics is sometimes a fine one. The way I like to remember it is in, in war, if your strategy is to cripple the enemy's ability to make war, you want to hurt their, hurt their supply lines. Tactics are sending tanks and helicopters to destroy their oil refineries. A strategy is affecting their supply lines. So a strategy is way, way high up in the sky. It's thinking big. Tactics is thinking small. You want to start with a strategy. It's very easy to jump right into the tactics and say, I'm going to start a Facebook page. I'm going to start, I'm going to start tweeting. But if, if your audience isn't there, if those tactics don't make sense, in light of what you're hoping to achieve in your objective, then you're going to be wasting your time. So try and follow those steps. At the end of it, and this is something a lot of people forget, measure the effectiveness of what you've done. You, you ideally want to be able to know for next time, for your next game, what worked and what didn't. So how would you measure things? On Twitter, you would use a shortened URL service like Bitly. Bitly provides you click traffic. Uh, on Facebook, you would use Facebook Insights. There's a lot of different ways to do it, Google Analytics for the web and so on. But for every tactic that you execute, try and make sure that you've got some way to measure its effectiveness. Some ways to measure effectiveness, sales. Sales is the most obvious, but you, know, you might have the most awesome game in the world that doesn't sell very well but gets a lot of buzz. It'll be important to know where that buzz is coming from so you can learn for later. So measure your traffic. Find out what people are saying about you. So we're going to jump into social media.
you know, we're going to jump into some of the tactic areas. So again, I told you everything in the marketing plan should be relatively straightforward and easy to follow. So what is social media? A lot of people are actually confused about this, and it's going to go over really quickly. Social media is blogging and microblogging. Blogs, you've seen them, Polygon, Rock, Paper, Shotgun. Microblogs are Twitter and Tumblr sites. They're, they're places where you don't write very long posts, essentially. Social networks include Facebook, LinkedIn. I count web forums as social networks. They, they work somewhat similarly. Basically, it's a place where a lot of people gather to talk about you or your game. And then you've got content sharing sites. They are social media, but uh, they're, I consider them more to be resources. You don't gather your community around a Facebook video. You can around a Facebook channel, but uh, it's typically more, you'll, you'll typically be using YouTube, Flickr, and other services as uh, some place to host videos of your game in action. They're places you link to from your blog or from your Twitter feed. So with the definitions out of the way, Let's talk about one of the key factors in social media. It's evangelists. These are people who love your game. These are people who love what they see in that alpha video. And they're the first to sign up to your community if you have one. This, this type of person is the kind of thing that makes social media so effective. So you want to identify them. It's easy to do that. They're the ones talking to you nonstop. They're the ones commenting on all your videos and tweeting at you or posting in your forum the most. You want to empower them. Don't be afraid of them. Embrace them. So by empower, what do I mean? I mean, hook them up with exclusive screenshots so that they can post them elsewhere on the web. Give them uh, lightweight admin access on your forums so that they can help further the discussion about your game. Reward them. Send them t-shirts. Give them t-shirts to, to share with their friends. If they're going to an event or, or a meeting or a LAN party, send them some stuff that they can give away. Even if it's just a printout with information about your game and a web link. Even easy stuff like this will help spread the word about your game. Another thing online evangelists do, do for you is they'll reach out to the press and they'll try and convince them to write about your game. Total Biscuit is a pretty well-known YouTube personality. He gets a lot of requests from people asking them to review this game or that game. It helps. It doesn't hurt. Sometimes people can be obnoxious about it, but it's always better to have them than not. So when you've got a community, try and find those evangelists and not to be too obtuse about it, but put them to work for you and reward them for their, for their time. Again, something as easy as a t-shirt. They're cheaper to create than you might think, but even just time and attention, access to early betas, anything to uh, keep them engaged with you will help. So a lot of people don't like to put in time and effort into social media, but again, it's free, it can be really effective, and it is worthwhile. So, how to make sure you don't waste your time? Find out where your target market goes. Are they on Tumblr? Do they just stick to Twitter? Is there a forum like NeoGAF? Go there, create an account, start posting. Make sure people know you. You want to post frequently. If you're out of sight, you're out of mind. If you're only posting once a week, that's a good start, but it's not great. You want to have something to say three to five times per week on your blog, in a forum, wherever you go. It sounds like a lot of work, but you actually don't need to put that much time and effort into it. Even just posting a new screenshot or some new feature you've implemented with a sentence describing it will usually suffice. You don't need to put in any, you don't need to write an essay essentially. Now, it sounds corny, but people on Twitter will follow you. It helps to follow them back. People on Facebook will click like. It helps to like their own posts back, especially for an influencer like a journalist. If you want to get their attention, or a blogger, if you want to get their attention, follow them on Facebook, follow them on Twitter, and start clicking that like button. 
it's corny, but after enough time, they'll start to notice you and remember your name. And when you ultimately are about to launch and you want to talk to them to get them to review your game, you won't be a complete stranger. More importantly than just hitting like and follow, you want to talk to people. This can be really difficult. I'm, I'm personally an introvert. I hate talking to people. I actually would prefer to just email them, but even just emailing can be difficult for some people. You do need to take that step and just talk to people, whether it's posting on a forum, responding to them on Twitter, wherever you are, you want to interact with people. You want to make sure that you're hearing their concerns, you're considering a feature they suggested, whatever. And finally, this one's really tough for people, but don't be afraid to just ask for a review. If, if you're selling your game on Amazon, a review can be a very powerful thing. If you want reviews for Steam, for your Steam game, go ahead and ask your fans, your community, people who follow you on social channels to do a review. It's, it's worth it. You will be surprised how many people will do so uncomplainingly. And again, if they're a part of your community, they probably like your game, so they're probably not going to say anything bad about it. Be bold. A great example of social media done really well. Wolf Fire is uh, creating overgrowth. I, I'm pretty sure the game hasn't launched yet, but their Facebook page is very active. They have a lot of fans posting all the time. They have a lot of followers. But more importantly, look to see what they do, what they post. They've always got a new video up, they're answering questions, they're posting screenshots. They're also linking to other people's games in some cases. This is social media done really well, and I encourage you all to check it out. Oops. So we're going to move on to PR. We're moving quickly again. My email address is at the bottom if you have more questions, and I'll be answering questions later. So public relations. There are some steps to the process that you'll follow in PR. Essentially, PR is where you want to try and get someone with influence to write about or review your game. When they do that, all their readers or viewers will see your game and want to buy it or not want to buy it, depending on the, on the uh, review. It all starts with relationships. It is very difficult to get a journalist or a blogger or a YouTube personality to respond to your emails if they don't know who you are. So again, before you launch, months before you launch, when you're in your beta stage, maybe even when you're in your alpha, if you're polished enough, find out, find out who your influencers are. And again, you can find that out by looking to see where your target audience goes and start talking with them. Again, click the like button, respond to their little witty tweet, whatever it takes. Just make sure that you show up on their radar every now and then. Then you're going to want to pitch them. I'll provide more, more detail into pitching separately, but basically that just means contacting them. When you contact an influencer, you want to be brief, you want to be detailed, and you want to be memorable. You have to remember that a lot of people and a lot of PR professionals are competing with you for their attention. So be, be brief, be detailed, be punchy, be interesting. A lot of people will write to a journalist or a blogger, but they won't follow up, and that is a terrible sin. In my experience, you have to follow up with someone once, even twice, before they'll respond to you. It's because they get so many emails from other people wanting reviews. It's because they have lives, and they need to go home at the end of the day, and they just can't get to everything. But when they see that you're following up, and you care enough to follow up, they'll be more likely to check out your message, check out your game, and respond one way or the other. It's always best to get a response from a journalist or a blogger or whoever than to not, because at least you'll know why they won't review your game, or at least you'll know if they have questions and do want to review it. Finally, you want to be able to uh, check out your coverage. This is something really simple. Go to Google and set up an alert. Uh, plug in a keyword such as your name, or the name of your game, and set, set uh, for daily reminders. Once you're in your launch phase, you'll want to be able to collect all of that coverage. 
It's great stuff to share with your fans. It's great proof for your next game that you're capable of launching and creating an awesome game. If you're courting publishers, they're probably going to want to see what other people have thought about your game. So, it's a relatively simple process. It does take a lot of work, but again, it doesn't cost you anything but time. Different types of influencers. You've got your journalists. They work at magazines. They work at newspapers. They even work at TV stations. But one example of a journalist would be an editor at PC Gamer. A blog, on the other hand, is something like Rock, Paper, Shotgun or Polygon. These are sites that don't have an offline component to them, or at least didn't start off as uh, a, a dead tree type of product. Journalists and bloggers work very similarly. In my experience, journalists are more likely to honor things called embargoes, where you try and keep everyone from uh, announcing the news about your game early. You want to try and keep them all synchronized. I think that's outdated thinking. You want to try and get everybody talking about your game when it's available for sale. If you have multi-million dollar budgets, you can do whatever you want. But ultimately, you don't want to try and put any restrictions on journalists and bloggers and others because it might affect their opinion of you. They might talk about your attempt to try and keep them from writing whenever they want it, and that doesn't look good. So work with them. You're a human being, and they'll, nine times out of ten, they will honor whatever your launch date is. YouTube personalities like Total Biscuit, something to keep in mind here, some of them think of themselves as journalists. Some of them hold themselves to a sort of an ethical standard. Some of them consider themselves entertainers. I believe Total Biscuit himself said that he believes he's an entertainer, so he will accept sponsorships. He does things like uh, accept a sponsorship from Sony to play Planet Side 2 on his channel. These are things that you can take advantage of. If Total Biscuit is just too busy to review your game, you can ask, can you do a sponsorship? That's something that's not free. You want to start off asking, would you please just review my game? It's fantastic. But sometimes you can take advantage of other means. But it's important to know the difference between entertainers and influencers. And finally, you've got your Twitter and Facebook celebrities. Some of these people can be really hard to get to. They'll have millions of followers or tens of thousands. They'll never respond to any comments. It's important regardless to try and um, communicate with them. If they even just see your name once, then it will have been worth it for the time you get a review of your game from them, either spontaneously because they heard about it somewhere else and want to talk about it, or in case you wanted to contact them for a review as well. So again, keep in mind, you don't want to just go after influencers because they're influential. You want to go after the people that your target audience considers influential. If you create a game for tweens and you're targeting business people, you're not going to get any sales. So don't forget. Now, pitching. Pitching is a whole other process, and it's something that I could do an entire webinar about. I recommend you visit a Gamasutra article I wrote. I promise it is full of details, it's easy to read, and is full of actionable information. In other words, you can read it and five minutes later be writing a pitch and probably get some responses. So write down that address and check out the article afterwards. Um, a few things about pitching, be concise. I try to never have more than two paragraphs of information, so three to four sentences per paragraph. Be detailed. Don't put in flowery language about how your game is going to revolutionize the industry. Talk about the awesome ability to adjust the world around you like Minecraft does, or some, some fun online capability you've, installed, you've created. Something that stands out, but don't put too many details in there, three or four maximum. Bullet points are fine. And be interesting. Don't be boring. Try, you know, your, your, your impression with a pitch starts at the subject line. You're going to want to be really interesting right up there. You can say something catchy like, hey, this is Eric from Tiger Style Games. That enough, that is enough to show someone that you're not a spam bot 
and that you're an actual human being. And that is usually enough to get them to read your first sentence. Your first paragraph, your first sentence needs to be amazingly interesting. It needs to be like the start of a book. A book only has a few paragraphs to capture your attention when you're at a bookstore. A pitch is the same way. So it's worth it to take the time to craft a good pitch. But go read that Gama Sutra article. It'll tell you everything you need to know. Now, PR is amazing. It has some drawbacks. You, first off, don't control what anyone says. They, once they have your game, they can say pretty much whatever, you, whatever they want, and they don't have to check with you about it. That can be a bad thing if your product is buggy or just plain not good. So before you send something to an influencer, be sure that you're putting your best foot forward. You also have no guarantees of coverage. Even though a, a reporter or a blogger will have asked to review your game, if Battlefield 4 comes out the next day, they may just forget about your game. It's the harsh realities of our existence, unfortunately. But something to keep in mind when you're making your marketing plan is, are there any crazy launches that you need to avoid, uh, such as the next uh, Battlefield game or the next League of Legends update or whatever? If you, or even big events like PAX or E3. You want to try not to launch during those periods because it can make influencers pretty busy. And finally, you've got poor odds of getting coverage. It's unfortunate, but you will probably send out dozens of pitches and not get any responses. It's, it's an unfortunate fact of life. It's the cost of doing this business. And the cost, again, by the way, is just time. The benefits of PR, it's free. And you're getting reviews, ideally, from people with great credibility, people who, whose opinion carries a lot of weight. That sort of thing sells, and that's good. When I, when I promoted Waking Mars a few months ago, I got all this press. How did I do it? Yeah, it helped that the game was fantastic. It helped that it had launched on iOS a while ago and had a little bit of mind share with people. People knew about it. But more importantly, I just asked. If you do not ask for reviews, you probably won't get them. Or if you do, you won't get very many of them. So be bold. And remember this, an article about your game in the right place at the right time is worth its weight in gold. Except those treasure chests need keys. But anyway, bad example, good thing to remember. So let's talk about events next. Events are things like PAX, E3, even your regional chapter meetings, any place where people gather and talk about games or pop culture, they're important to go to because your target market will be right there. Hopefully you know who your target market is by now. If you're going after people aged 18 to 30, something like the Penny Arcade Expo is a great place to go. You've got a lot of people in that age range there. They're all gamers. Events are also fantastic because you get to meet influencers without worrying about getting through to them via email or hoping they'll see your tweet. You can just walk right up to them, if you know what they look like, and introduce yourself. If you do that, please be sure to have some information about your game handy. You, you may only get one opportunity to meet with them. They may not come back to your booth or table. They may not have a chance to visit your website after the show. So have a piece of paper a printout, have a USB drive with a beta of your game on it. By the way, quick tip, this can be a little embarrassing, but when you're at an event and everyone has their name badges slung around their chest, press, media, bloggers, they usually have a unique color or a unique sort of uh, ribbon around their badge so that you know that they're media. When you, when you attend a show for the first time in that first hour, Try to find out what that badge looks like. When you go to register at registration, ask someone. As you're walking through the show floor, as people are passing by your booth, keep an eye out for that color. And when you see it, walk up to that person, introduce yourself, ask them who do they work for, and start talking about your game. It can be really difficult to do. Some people are really shy. The person might look really busy. 
by all means, do not interrupt them if they're in the middle of a conversation. But if they're just walking around, stop them. Because if they're there, it means that they're on the job. And you and your game are their job. So you might also be able to meet an investor or a publisher. And you might also be able to meet partners. You, if you're looking for an artist, you might be able to find one there. A lot of people are out there with resumes or hoping to build resumes or portfolios uh, who might want to join you or who might have a piece of technology that might make your, your life a little easier. So they're valuable. You also don't need to actually have a booth at an event to get value out of it. All of these things I told you about, you can do without having a booth. So again, if you've got money, that's great. If you don't, buy a ticket, show up at the, show up at the event, and do all these things to try and find people who will help you. If you are going to an event, this is a list of things you can do. I've talked, believe it or not, I've talked to a lot of people over the years who think, okay, I've got a booth, I'm showing off my game, you know, that's good enough, right? But it isn't. It's surprising how many people will just walk past your booth without even stopping and looking. It's amazing how many people will come by, check out your game for 30 seconds, and then just leave. You want to keep them there for as long as possible. Because the longer they stay, the more likely they are to remember you, to check you out later, and ultimately to buy your game when it launches. So rule number one, make sure your game is playable if you're going to be there. Even if you're not exhibiting, have your, have your laptop, have a tablet, and let people play the game. Even if it's just one level, even if it's just one screen, as long as it's playable and looks good, you'll come away with a good impression. Giveaways can be anything from something you give away as part of a contest to something that's just sitting on a table or in your backpack, like a piece of paper with information about your game, a, a small USB drive with a beta or screenshots or movies about your game. Have these things available. It'll help you be more memorable at these events. If, you, if your game makes sense to host a tournament with, please do so. Um, at PAX in uh, last September, uh, the developers of Cardinal Quest, a roguelike, um, hosted a quick tournament. Basically, the person who lasted longest in their game was the winner. This was not a multiplayer game. It's a very, very much a single player experience. But they were able to make a little tournament. And it got a bunch of people to stop and play. And it got a bunch of people to stop and watch. And it cost them very little time and effort. Um, Contests, this is basically drop your name in a hat and you'll win later. This is a great way to collect names for a mailing later on. When you're about to launch, you can send an email out to all these people to let them know to come check it out or buy it. If you're going to do that, by the way, be sure to give them an opportunity to opt out of future communication. In some countries, like the US, it's in the law that you must do that. Throw a party or attend a party. Whatever you do, go. If you're shy and you're a wallflower, be bold. This is the only way that you're going to be able to reach people. And when you're at an event, you need to make the most use of your time because it costs you to be there. Go to parties, introduce yourself, make plans to meet with people afterwards or the next day, especially if you see those influencers with their special badges. This is a great uh, informal setting to meet people. If you're going to go to an event, it's a great place to have an interview with a journalist or a blogger or someone else. You can set up an interview beforehand. Uh, before the show, try and get in touch at least two weeks before, if not sooner, that uh, you're going to be at the show and you'd love to show them the latest build and do they have time. More, th more often than not, they'll say yes because they want to fill up their calendar with a lot of meaningful meetings. Now by cross promotions, what I mean by that is, for example, if you've got a booth and there's another booth nearby with another indie developer, you can agree to tell visitors to your booths to visit each other's booths. If, uh, if I have someone checking out my game is about to leave, I can suggest to them, hey, go check out my friend's booth it's, uh, it's a fantastic game. I think you'll like it. That is the easiest, most lightweight type of cross-promotion you can do. 
better yet, share a booth, incorporate uh, elements of their game into yours. Essentially, work as a partner instead of a competitor with other people. If you know of the Indie Mega Booth at PAX, this is the sort of spirit that made that such a success. Lead gathering, again, I mentioned in contests where you gather business cards. Um, lead gathering is essentially collecting names and email addresses, uh, getting people to follow you on Twitter or Facebook or whatever social network you have. Events are a great place to do that because you've got a captive audience. You can actually ask them to follow you to get more information. You can hand them a card so they can do it later. You want to collect this information so you've got people to talk to later on. It's the start of a community or it will bolster your community. And finally, content creation. What I mean by that is when you're at an event, take pictures. Take a video of someone playing your game or experiencing it. Check out other people's stuff and take pictures of it. And then when you get back home or back to the hotel room, post the video, post pictures onto your community site into a forum that you're participating in. Remember, I told you you want to post to social media three to five times a week at least. This is something that will make that possible. And again, don't also, don't worry about, um, you know, it's two weeks after a show and you still haven't posted all your pictures. It's okay to keep doing it. Don't wait two months, but be sure to make use of all that time and effort you put in collecting all the content. And again, think differently. The Indie Mega Booth was, you know, two and a half years ago, this quaint little idea that has turned into this huge thing. It's gotten a lot of press every single time, and every time they execute it, more and more coverage. Such an easy little idea. You can probably do something similar, where you pool your resources, money, and time to create your own sort of Indie Mega Booth at your own events. But more importantly than that, think, think of what other people haven't come up with yet. Try and come up with something crazy and different. Try not to limit yourself to the rules. Marketing works best when you do something unexpected that people find enjoyable. I can't tell you what that is. It's up to you to decide that. But take some time when you're creating your marketing plan or when you're coming up with something to do at an event to come up with something interesting and new and unique. Even if it's complicated, it might be worth it. It just might. So that's the high-level overview. I've uh, come to the Q&A session. So if you've got questions, please go ahead and type them into the little chat box in the webinar, and I'll do my best to answer them. I'm pausing the screen temporarily. I'll be right back. And we're figuring out how to answer questions. Please, please bear with us.
Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can everybody else hear me? Um, I will just read them off to you. Does that work? That sounds good. The first one says, Facebook seems to keep downplaying page posts in the news feed, steering us toward paying for promoted posts to truly reach our audience. Should we bite the bullet and pay for promoted posts? Is there a better way to consistently reach our Facebook audience? This, this is going to sound maybe counter to everything I've said, but Facebook ads are actually effective. I find them effective because you can target very specifically the kind of person you want to reach. And they're cheap. It's very self-service. But that said, some of us just don't have any budget, and that's fine. While I do believe that they're worthwhile, you don't need to use them to reach your, your audience. What I would recommend is that you encourage everyone to follow your Facebook page, to like your posts, actually ask them to like your post, and post frequently. The way Facebook has tweaked the way they show everything on their, um, their graph, you're gonna, your fans are going to be seeing a lot more ads and a lot more irrelevant stuff, promoted stuff. You're going to want to be able to cut through that clutter, and one of those means is by posting a little more often. Next question. Is there any point to bump the likes on a page using some kind of company that adds likes for a fee? Um, I don't believe that's worth it. It's, uh, first of all, it's not really going to add any more credibility to a Facebook page if you only have a, a low number of fans. What you're more interested in is real life people who actually come to your page and comment. The likes aren't going to be that meaningful if real people aren't there. And if real people aren't there, people aren't going to be buying your game. So I would invest your money in a Facebook ad where you can ask someone to like something, like your page or your ad, um, or invest your money in doing something fun, like a little giveaway contest. There, ultimately, there are better ways to spend your money. Next question. If people purchase and don't like the game and are vocal about it on Facebook, what's the best way to respond? Apologize, gently engage, ask them to email you, ban them from the page. <laughs> okay. This is uh, on a case-by-case -case basis kind of thing. You want to be very careful here. Do they have a legitimate complaint? Is it because of a bug? If it is because of a bug, that is your fault. Apologize and offer to help them. More often than not, someone will take you up on that offer. And if you can solve their problem, be bold. Ask them to post on your page. Let them know that you resolved the problem. Is it not your fault? Is it because of their system configuration? Is it because they're morons? You know, there's lots of different reasons. Don't apologize. When you, take when you apologize, you take responsibility for something, and you don't want to take responsibility for something that's not your fault. But it's still worth a little bit of time to try and understand what their problem is and try and help them through it. Ultimately, when someone has taken the actually extraordinary step of opening their computer, launching their browser, going to Facebook, going to your page, typing in a comment, that actually takes a lot of steps. Companies pay marketers like me a lot of money to get people to do that. So when someone has done that, it's worth it to acknowledge their time. If they're trolling, ignore them or delete the post. I hope that helps. <laughs> Next question. Do you have any tips for marketing starting out in an especially small audience, for example, New Zealand? Yes. Um, when you're dealing with a very small market or a very niche product, uh, you want to find out, again, where your target audience is. Figure out who those people are. Figure out where they go, what they do. 
and focus your marketing efforts there. So if I was focused, if I was living in a, a small country, um, my, my initial thought would be the local paper or local papers. Sometimes you, instead of just a newspaper, you might have a monthly paper dedicated to entertainment. Um, get to know those journalists. Take them out to lunch. They might have time on their hands. And get to know them. Other things are show up to meetings. Um, sometimes you'll see events like uh, club gatherings. Um, if it looks relevant, if it looks like your audience is there, attend and talk about your game if it makes sense to do so. Ultimately, um, think creatively. Don't limit yourself. Don't look around and say there's nothing I can do here. There's always something you can do. There might be a partnership with a company that you can enter in. Um, also, um, some uh, advertising platforms online like Facebook ads let you micro-target. So you can just target people in your country or in just one city in a certain age range. So that might also be a way to reach people. Next question actually was asked by two people. So hopefully this covers both of your uh, questions. How early is too early to engage on the PR front? Should we hold back until we're nearly finished? Do we want to build more buzz during a longer lead up? Or does that set us up for aren't you done yet comments? To me, um, the time to start engaging is when you have something to show. So even when you're in the alpha stage, if you've got a level ready, if you've got your character design set, if you know what your game is ultimately going to look like, that's the time, the time to start sending some info out. Rock, Paper, Shotgun frequently writes about stuff that's many months away from launching. Lots of bloggers will do that too. Journalists, and I consider something like GameSpot, IGN, whatever, those guys, they tend not to review stuff that early unless it's from a, a big studio. But the smaller sites will. And just getting that, that amount of press is worthwhile. Also, send updates at your milestones. So when you've got a beta, that's a natural point to stop and say, hey guys, check out what I just made. When you've got your first video, send that over as a link, of course, not as an attachment. Um, as soon as you have something to show, that's the time to start talking about it. Just don't overdo it. I would limit myself to one major communication a month, at least, up until your launch period, at which point you want to start talking to someone a month out, and then two weeks out, and then at your launch. Okay, next question. To learn from others, what would you say was the worst indie marketing move that you have seen? What made it so terrible if it's not obvious? Hmm. Tough call. I mean, lots of there's always lots of disasters um, that you read about every time, every day, but uh, Nothing really springs to mind, but I, I will say there is there's one disaster that happens all the time and you never hear about it. And please don't think this is corny. This is real. A lot of guys, a lot of developers will create their game and launch it and then start their press. They'll start their publicity, essentially. That is the worst time to start promoting your game. You have newsworthiness on your side before your launch. People who write about video games want to talk about the latest and greatest. When you've launched, you're no longer the latest and greatest. That is a tragedy to me. That is, that is a, a total failure of uh, marketing, essentially. It, I know that it can be very time consuming and, and difficult to promote something while you're building it. But if you do want to sell it, if you do want people to play it, you have to start and you have to put in the time and effort. Find, find someone to help you, even if it's a family member or friend or an online evangelist, as I mentioned. Take the time to make that happen. It will pay you back in spades. But again, that is, 
That is the worst thing that I see all the time. That is far more damaging than someone's outburst on a documentary or someone screwing up at a trade show or someone's game crashing live on stage. Not doing your marketing right, waiting till after you've launched is the greatest tragedy in the world to me. Is there one centralized tool that's best to use to measure traffic on the various social media outlets? There's a, there's a paid tool called Radian 6, R-A-D-I-A-N number 6. It's not free. It's something that agencies use, and it's pretty effective. Um, it takes a little while to master. Um, I, I think it's something like $500 a month. So again, not cheap probably overkill for what you'll need it for. Um, I haven't found a centralized tool that's perfect. Um, I'll always use a mixture of uh, uh, Google Analytics on the website. I create a Bitly account to track all the, um, all the Bitly clicks that I get. And then I use, and, and I rely on that to tell me also how I'm performing on Twitter. And I use Facebook page insights to tell me how something like Facebook's going. Ultimately, if you've got a smaller community, figuring, you know, checking out all these analytics will probably only take you less than 10 minutes a day. Um, if you've got a huge community and you are successful and you're making money, it might be worth it to use a paid tool. But at that point, I'd rather just turn it all over to a community manager and have them report to me every now and then. So ultimately, Stick to the free stuff that's, that, that works. Google Analytics, Facebook Page Insights, Bitly click measurements are effective and they're free. Next question. Hey Eric, my brother and I started a game studio and launched our first game and got a surprising amount of coverage, Kotaku, IGN, etc., for a new mobile game from an unheard of company. However, it didn't seem to really translate to sales all that well. What would be some tips for actually translating that positive coverage into sales, or how would we identify where our pitfall was in making the sale, price point, audience, etc. Something you might you might um, experience when you actually get press from a big place is uh, no sales or no activity, and that happens. It's it's all part of the volatility of PR, um, but you can still make something with it. And what I would recommend you do is comb through that review for a, a good quote or some interesting comment. Um, and then plaster that comment everywhere you can. <laughs> create, create a little video of your game. Start, start the video off with that comment. Let people know where it came from because it does carry weight. Um, post the links to that review if you can on your social channels, on your community or what have you. One of the most important things though that I found is sometimes the bigger sites just won't link to your game, which is completely, I'll be just blunt, is completely dumb. I've rarely seen a blogger fail to link to the thing they're talking about, but sometimes newspapers, magazines, and big game sites just won't link to you, which is nuts. But be brave, write to them and say, would you please include a link to my site in your review or at the end of your review somewhere on your page. If they won't do that, post in the comments. It is actually remarkably difficult for people to go from reading a review to visiting your website to buying your game. The, the more things you can do to make it easier, and that can be just as simple as having your link uh, in there, in that article somewhere, the more things you can do to make it easier, the more sales you'll end up with. So, you know, right off the bat, that's what I would do to uh, try and get a little bit more effectiveness out of that article. And also, if you've got any more news for that, uh, hopefully you've got the contact, that, that re reviewer, you've got their contact information, feel free to contact them in the future and see if there's anything else you can do. Um, they might be open to doing an interview with you. Uh, so, you know, a Q&A to follow up the review might spur a little bit more attention, might get more attention on the review itself might get you more traffic or sales. Okay, hey, uh, everyone, we're down to five minutes left on the webinar. We will keep going through the questions 
Um, but if we don't get to your question, uh, head over to Facebook. We've started a thread there where you can ask your question and Eric will go through and follow up there as well. Uh, next question, uh, do release dates matter? Should I avoid the busy fall season, for example? Release dates absolutely matter. Uh, you want to try and avoid launching alongside something huge. Uh, that, can, that can be something like a Battlefield 4. It could also be a huge movie, um, a big piece of news, although I appreciate you can't really anticipate that. But if you know the Pope's going to get elected in a month, maybe push off your game launch to after a month. As far as the, the fall season goes where everyone's launching their game, it can be tough, um, but I would say it's worth it because, yes, everyone's launching their game, but that's also when reviewers are at their busiest. They're out there looking for stuff to review. They've got a lot of stuff coming their way, and you might be one of the people who gets a review. So if it makes sense in your schedule, for example, if you finish your game in February, don't wait till September. Uh, if it makes sense in your schedule, I would say it's okay to launch during that time. But again, look at your marketing plan. Do you have, uh, do you know where your target audience is? Do you already have an existing relationship with the people who will be reviewing your game? If you feel good about being able to get a review because they know you, then I would say it's a safe bet. Go ahead and launch. If, you, if they don't know you, if you don't have very much visibility, if you have a small community, then I would wait. I would wait until a slightly quieter period. It might be worth it. Okay, we'll do one last question because I believe the webinar will just end. Um, so if your question wasn't asked, again, please go ahead and either shoot Eric an email or post it on the Facebook uh, page. Last question, what would you suggest when games struggle to gain approval on a platform like Steam Green, Greenlight? There's a tremendous backlog of games there, even though they get all the likes, etc. they need. Greenlight's tough. You need, you need a lot of votes, tens of thousands. I think it's 100,000 votes. Um, I don't know the exact number, but you may think you're doing really well, but you'll only have gotten 10% of the way to, to getting the green light. What I would recommend there is don't stop promoting the game. Try and get influencers to check it out. In the case of Waking Mars, they hadn't been greenlit yet, but when Total Biscuit finally reviewed them, uh, we got something like 20,000 uh, greenlight votes. I don't remember what the actual number is, but it was tremendous. Um, that really, really helped. So don't ever stop trying to promote it. Another tip is try and get to know someone at Steam. If you don't already have a contact, get in touch, let them know that you're working on it. Every time you see a, a nice bump, get in touch and let them know. Don't be obnoxious, but let them know how interested you are. Make sure they know your game exists, and they may just eventually decide to say, okay, you haven't gotten all the way, but you've done a, a great effort. People clearly care about this game. We're going to include you. So ultimately, just don't quit. <laughs> All right. Well, I think since that was the last question, again, email me if you have more or join us on Facebook. I'll be answering more questions throughout the day. And I may be so bold as to promote one thing of my own. I do work with Intel. and They have a something called the Perceptual Computing Challenge starting up sometime next week. Think Connect, but for your PC. Um, if there's going to be big prizes. It's going to be fun. You're going to be able to get a camera and uh, play around with stuff. Sign up on that site to get some information for when it launches. And uh, I do hope you participate in it because it could be pretty cool. And uh, that's all my contact info again. And I'm here to help. I want to make sure that uh, every game that launches has its fair shot. So please do not hesitate to get in touch. And thank you, everyone, for joining. And thank you to the IGDA for having me.